Okay, so our first speaker this afternoon is Professor Sue Nipschowski, and Sue is Professor in Medieval Literature in the School of Arts, Culture and Language at Bangor University. She's also Director of Stephen Colclough Centre for History and Culture of the Book. Her research and publication centre on medieval women's writing with a particular interest in women's responses to the Virgin Mary. And this afternoon, Sue will be presenting her paper entitled Mary, Mindfulness and the Mise en Page, Wellbeing and the Book of Hours. So over to you, Sue. Thank you very much, Vicky, and thank you, Ree. Um, OK, um, the purpose of this, this talk this afternoon was really to, to open up the discussion of the Book of Hours um, broader than simply its academic texts that are contained therein. So I'd be very pleased to have people's um, responses and reactions. Um, so off we go. Um, beset by a global pandemic, people have turned to books and the comfort that they can bring. In this period of uncertainty, and for so many, one of grief and loss, Abigail Boucher, Chloe Harrison and Marcello Giovanelli suggest that people have sought out subject matter that is predictable, if not necessarily comforting, finding solace in the security of formulaic genre and previously read books. Books have thus bolstered well-being during this difficult time, raising the question if similar was the experience in earlier periods. Throughout the Middle Ages, one means of dealing with the negative emotions and impact on well-being brought about by pandemic, war, illness, bereavement and the lottery of childbirth was to turn to one's prayer book or book of hours. The book of hours, at whose heart lies devotion to the Virgin Mary, has uh, been subject matter, has subject matter that is largely predictable and formulaic. Over 30 years ago, Susan Groag Bell demonstrated that women had a special relationship to the Book of Hours and that this is now a common place of scholarship on medieval manuscripts and women. The material condition of many of these prayer books confirms that they were much read and treasured by the women who owned them and then bequeathed them to their female relatives. So drawing on literary, manuscript studies and bibliotherapy, this paper introduces a series of folios from women associated books of hours to start to consider the ways in which the act of rereading Mary might foster mental well-being and offer medieval women a taxonomy of consolation. So a few thoughts about the Book of Hours as a popular genre. The popularity of Books of Hours, or I, or as they are known in Middle English primers, is evinced by the number of survivals of this kind of book. Eamon Duffy calculates that almost 800 manuscript books of hours made for use in England are scattered in libraries all over the world and surviving printed versions produced for the English market in the two generations before the Reformation are even more abundant. It is with the membrane codices that this paper will concern itself. The Book of Hours comprises a set of defining features summarised by Christopher de Hamel as a distinctive cycle um, of prayers and psalms to be recited at each of the eight hours which divided up the medieval religious day. The hours of Matins, Lords, Prime, Turf, Sex, Known, Vespers and Compline. These short cycles were dedicated to specific religious themes or saints, pr principally the Virgin Mary. Their books of hours range from the small to the large, from high status products for the nobility to more modest copies for those of lesser means. And in many ways predictable and formulaic, the Book of Hours was also readily customised to meet the devotional needs and interests of their commissioners. As Eric Quackle has noted, while the scribe produced a manuscript, the choices leading to its ultimate design were not solely his own. They were also influenced by the individual for whom the book was made. These books then have been described by Duffy as a script for the drama of personal religion to be the text of the prayers that people prayed. It was to their books of hours that owners turned at moments of crisis, the stresses and strains of quotidian life, such as birth and death, business and personal interactions, and also on, also on days less dramatic. In the face of life's challenges, in what ways might these familiar and much read Marian books foster what today might be called mental health, well-being and resilience? A few thoughts on literature and mindfulness. The significance of literature, of the text itself, that is, in fostering well-being was recognised and understood in the Middle Ages. The poet Geoffrey Chaucer understood the power of literature in aiding sleep and, li and literal restless restfulness. In his book, The Book of the Duchess, the dreamer narrator rendered insomniac by unrequited love requests, I quote, a romance to read and drive the night away. The act of reading brings sleep to the suffering narrator 
and its restorative powers cause him to awaken reinvigorated and eager to write. Uh, slide, please, Re. Um, the potential for the overtly spiritual text within books and hours to foster mental well-being and resilience should not be underestimated. The religious texts within the books of hours enable, um, sorry, uh, the, the uh, potential for the overtly spiritual texts within books and hours to foster men mental well-being and resilience should not be underestimated. The religious texts within these books enable an individual to employ what Harold G. Koenig characterizes as religious coping resources, since he argues strongly held beliefs give meaning to difficult life circumstances and provide a sense of purpose. These cognitions also give a subjective sense of control over events, i.e. if God is in control, can influence circumstances and can be influenced by prayer, then prayer by the individual may positively influence the situation. These beliefs also help to normalize loss and change and provide role models of persons suffering with the same or similar problems, often illustrated in religious scriptures. With their prayers to Christ, the Virgin and saints, the Book of Hours is scaffolded upon the understanding that life's events are within God's control. Its many texts offer a, a consolatory script, if you will, the lines to be said silently or aloud, individually or collectively, hourly or daily, to accompany the cradle to grave events that mark human life and that can trigger anxiety. Now time permits only one example of such a, a text, um, Rhi, if you could move the slides on again, please. Um, I want to introduce you to an Anglo-Norman prayer for the safe delivery and childbirth composed by Matilda Beckett, who died around about 1141 and was the mother of Thomas of London, Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, her prayer is preserved in a 14th century book of hours, owned and most probably commissioned by a woman called Hoisia de Bois, who we believe flourished in around 1328. Um, now, if we have a quick look at the slide. Uh, what you've got there is um, an image of the Virgin Mary with, we believe, a donor portrait of Hoesia there on the left, praying to uh, the Virgin, and it is her husband on the right. But the next leaf is the tail end of this prayer um, composed by um, Matilda Beckett. Now, in this prayer, um, we have uh, it's voiced by a pregnant woman and the speaker addresses God, encouraging him to aid her by recalling that he too was once a vulnerable baby born to term and who was breastfed by his mother. Uh, the speaker requests that God, for the love that he has for his own mother, the Virgin, relieve the speaker's labour pains and as importantly, ensure that her child is born well and whole. The quid pro quo is that if she survives childbirth, the speaker will then attend her purification. It's a very early mention of the ceremony of the churching of women here and be as willing a servant of God as Mary was at her annunciation. The speaker then addresses the Virgin directly uh, and Matilda, the speaker's Mary, is the young mother who has suckled her child and then Matilda frames her relationship to Mary as one of mistress and handmaiden. Of course, handmaiden being a term used by Mary herself in the Magnificat when she anticipates the glory that she will receive as the mother of God. Matilda also acknowledges Mary as a compassionate intercessor, a giver of succor, and finally as the queen of all virgins, the latter of whom the speaker invokes for further aid, along with the apostles, the glorious confessors, and the precious, precious martyrs. Um, she has belt and braces here. Everybody who could possibly help is invoked in the prayer. Now, the prayer never loses focus on the pregnant woman's body. Um, the emotions evoked in the prayer are embodied or lifted from the page as it is voiced. Um, and the, these emotions range from anxiety aroused by recollected or imagined pain of childbirth, if the person has not already undergone childbirth, to a hope for successful delivery. So the textual features of the prayer, the supplication, the bargaining, and recalling Mary's own successful motherhood support um, the mental well-being of a woman approaching her confinement, and also a woman or women who might be about to aid a friend or a relative during such labor. Now I want to think further now about mindfulness and membrane. Now, clearly the spiritual instruction contained in, in texts within books of hours had the potential to render negative life events less distressing. 
But in focusing on the text within the Book of Hours, it's possible to overlook the potential for a codex of this kind to foster mental well-being in ways associated with the book as a material object that is separate from the actual text therein. Uh, slide please, Re. Um, as the book historian Tom Mole advises, uh, focusing on the written word within books can actually elide the significance of the codex itself. He writes, learning to read means to stop looking at the book in front of us and start looking through it. The book starts itself starts to vanish to seem as though it's hardly a thing at all. As we gain the ability to lose ourselves in a book, the book as an object begins to get lost. Now, the connection between material objects and fostering mental well-being has been the subject of a 2020 study by Inge Beate Larsen, Tora Dagbur and Alan Torpor, who conclude that interaction with objects that are mean meaningful to a subject can actually influence physical, social and emotional movement into the recovery of mental well-being. Um, the, the familiarity of these objects can open up new ways of thinking and dealing with stresses and strains um, of everyday life that the, the individual had not perhaps thought of before. Um, and this emotional movement is achieved through the agency or for positive change that an object might encourage. Now, a frequently reread and much treasured book of hours, I think is a prime candidate to encourage in its owner movement towards recovery into well, me, well mental well-being. Uh, Tom Moult has actually gone as far as acknowledging the power of the book to foster change, observing that books are not just passive tools, but capable of exerting forces of their own on their owners. Now, in a recent interview, uh, Rajlaxmi Jain, a multidisciplinary designer, has noted the benefits to well-being um, within features of the printed book that can bring about um, improvements in mental well-being. Um, more so than actually accessing literature on a screen. Since uh, Jane suggests that with the latter, that is on screen uh, literature, you cannot feel text textures, tear a page, smell freshly printed paper, paste stickers, um, scribble with crayons. Although Jane focuses here on children's printed books, the aspects of physicality that she suggests improves mental health are overtly foregrounded in the manufacture of medieval books. Manuscript books are eminently tactile. Their pages are made of skin that possess both the hair and flesh side, the quality of which changes over time through repeated handling. Uh, slide please, Re. Like all medieval manuscript codices, personal books of ours might contain marks of their use and reuse as itemised by Christopher de Hamel, as signs of manufacture, erasures, scratches, overpainting, offsets, patches, sewing holes, bindings and nuances of colour and texture, texture. It is in these idiosyncrasies that a book of ours creates a, a personal connection with its user and the image there is of a book of hours, um, uh, an English produced book of hours that's currently in the public library in Bo Boston, Massachusetts. And you can see, I, I chose that illustration simply because you can see that the heraldry at the bottom is starting to wear off. Um, there's signs of grubbiness on the side. Uh, clearly the book has been trimmed at some point as well and, and placed into um, a, a different set of covers, but you can really see the use um, of the individual there of their book of hours. In addition to reading then, um, the book of hours texts for their well-being, the owner of a book of hours touched, caressed and even ingested their prayer books, all actions that might aid movement into mental good health. Catherine Rudy has explored the implication of the transfer of grease and dirt from users' fingers to their books of hours, gauging that the dirtiest pages were those most frequently turned to and turned over, of course, by their owners. Uh, slide, please. Uh, Rudy notes that users, and in her case study, these were nuns, were selective in and when and at what they, point they entered their books. It's clear, she, she says, that users did not read these kinds of books from beginning to end. Instead, they appear to have selected texts relevant to the time of day, the time of the liturgical year, or an important event such as the anniversary of the death of a loved one. Further, her analysis suggests that um, the instance of dirt indicates that users were in the habit of holding their books in a particular way each time they returned to their text. So the transfer of a reader's own corporality to her book might extend beyond the grease and dirt of her fingers to her actual saliva, 
since books of hours retain the evidence of images that um, were repeatedly kissed for, one assumes, oscillatory consolation. And to, to a consideration of images themselves that this paper now turns. As Stephen Jean Nichols observes, the dynamics of the apartment page, uh, which I like to think of as the manuscript matrix, conjures not an inert place of inscription, but in an interactive space, inviting continual representational and interpretive active, act, uh, sorry, activity. One element of the mise en page, a term used for the general layout and organization of the manuscript page, um, and a further opportunity for interactivity with one's book is engagement with the images that uh, illustrate books of hours. Um, Duffy has said that the pictures in books of hours both enhanced the text that they accompanied and worked independently of them. Many images were designed to specifically arouse intense devotional feelings in those who gazed at them. Now, Images in Books of Hours certainly encourage an effective response in the viewer. An identification with Mary's successful motherhood as presaged in images of her annunciation, her suffering at the crucifixion as she sees her son put to death, and of course, Christ's suffering for humanity. Um, now, this identification might be enhanced for those who could afford it by the inclusion of donor portraits that were in direct line of sight and indeed dialogue with the Virgin. Now, it's clear that um, a primary um, uh, purpose of images in Books of Hours was to inform and reinforce the spiritual message of Christian salvation and therefore offer spiritual support, spiritual support for their users. Uh, slide, please. Um, in addition, though, uh, what I would suggest is that the components of image that mark the aesthetic of prayer book illustration might also play a role in fostering well-being above and beyond the spiritual messages of support associated with these images. The vibrant use of colour made from minerals and plants, the cool smoothness of burnished gold leaf with its light catching quality, the banderoles containing snatches of chants and indeed evoking um, music if not representing music itself, the marginal illustration of flora, fauna and the comic grotesques all had the potential to change the viewer's mood for the better. Now this might be achieved through their appeal to an ability to work on all of the senses, sight, touch, taste, smell and hearing. At a minimum, the images in her book of hours offered its owner what Martha Driver and Michael all consider enhanced enjoyment of the written page. And if we have a look at the hours of Catherine of Cleves here, um, uh, just an image that I've chosen at random because it illustrates so many of these features about which I'm talking. The, um, uh, the uh, beautiful gold leaf um, mandorla in which Mary is surrounded. Uh, I'm afraid the image doesn't do it justice. It's beautiful. Uh, beautifully shiny and lustrous still, and of course smooth and cool to touch. You've got um, Anna, uh, sorry, Catherine of Cleves, I beg your pardon, um, uh, presented in her own book here. You've got this wonderful bar border on each side. I love the owl particularly, um, and there's a further reinforcement of um, Catherine's well-being at the uh, in the, the bottom margin. You've got illustrations of her heraldic. Um, uh, designs and those of her husband. Now why I've chosen this particular image is that the book was commissioned by Catherine herself very possibly for her marriage to Duke Arnold of Gelders but how this book supported her is I think a matter of great interest because we know that there was a great falling out between her and her husband, so much so that by um, they're married in 1430, by 1440, they actually aren't living together or speaking to each other. So how she repeatedly returned to this book and the support that it, get, it will have given her, I think is a matter for, for further research and, and, and of great interest. Um, so, brief conclusions then. Um, things make us as much as we make things. And a woman's book of hours might offer her consolation and support in developing resilience against the stresses and anxieties that life can bring in what might be termed a taxonomy of consolation. The, the literal texts contained within her book of hours encourage her to seek consol co the consolatory in the love of God and in his son's sacrifice and in his mother's power to intercede, intercede above and beyond the spiritual support offered by these texts. 
On another level, the repeated act of returning to her prayer book, of feeling its skin touching hers, and encountering the images that offer multi-sensory stimulation might not only console, but move its owner forward into better mental health and resilience when times become troubling for her. At last slide, please. Um, this is certainly the impression given by Marjorie Kemp in, who her, in her book records that in a moment of peace um, with her primer, she can be found in her parish church uh, at prayer, juggling or perhaps at being relieved from the stresses of juggling being a wife, mother of 14 and pursuing this desire to be a sponsor Christie. Um, I think similar can be intimated in these two well-known images of women with their books of hours. You've got the Madeline um, there uh, reading her book of hours. Uh, you can see its beautiful book covering and its clasps. She's lost in the moment of reading, as is Mary of Burgundy um, in this marvellous image of her, again with a beautifully um, looked after and prepared book of hours, um, lost in the text, but also having a moment of quiet contemplation and thinking about the Virgin Mary. So, to conclude then, um, it seems that Solace was found by contemporary readers during um, and in the continuing COVID times by rereading books that are familiar to us, books um, that are um, perhaps uh, consolatory in their uh, familiarity and in the way that they are set out. Um, and it seems that this kind of consolation and mental well-being support was shared by our medieval counterparts as they encountered their books of ours. Thank you.